Suck chooms, how y'all living? Hope everything is Nova and you're all having a preem week. So, in the past few years, mainstream scientific opinion has been under assault by attention-seeking influencers who are looking to establish themselves online by taking contrarian opinions against the scientific and medical establishment. Ever since the advent of social media in the mid-2000s, the uneducated and the unqualified have been given a very powerful voice that has been amplified by platforms like Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and of course, YouTube as well. Your average layman spends far more time online mindlessly scrolling through social media brain rot than they ever do reading scientific research. So, the people who have had the most outreach to the general public have been the influencers who are merely the most prolific rather than those who give out the most evidence-based scientific information. This has caused a shift in the paradigm of human knowledge. People now believe that bacon is a superfood, but vegetables will kill you. They believe that seed oils are dangerous and that butter and lard are healthy. They believe vaccines are more more dangerous than the diseases they are meant to treat. Thanks to this kind of social media brainwashing, we are now living in opposite land. If you want to know what the mainstream position is amongst the public, then just look at what the science says and 99% of the time, the general population will hold the opposite opinion. Science has now been politicized and now most people think that scientific data is woke. This kind of reflexive anti-science contrarian mindset has become so prevalent that the anti-mainstream has now become the new mainstream and the pro-establishment has become the new anti-establishment. So people don't get to call themselves health rebels anymore just because they put butter in their coffee, drink raw milk, and avoid vegetables. They're not rebels. I mean, how can they be rebels when they're just doing what is already popular on social media? They're just trend-following posers pushing yet another fad diet which is supported by a multi-billion dollar industry that is fueled by crunchy mom bloggers and internet tough guy culture warriors. They are not rebels. What they really are are sheep. They don't get to call themselves rebels when they're doing something that almost everybody already believes because the majority of people these days do hold anti-scientific positions. The anti-science movement is now more powerful than the pro-science movement. You can see strong evidence in this in the fact that the most powerful health-related public figure in the world, RFK Jr., is himself an anti-science conspiracy theorist male crunchy mom, Crank, who will trust a Facebook meme over a half a million scientists. So people can't claim they're anti-establishment anymore when the most powerful people in the world already agree with them. Instead, it's people like me who promote the scientific establishment who are the new health rebels. Like I said earlier, being pro-establishment is the new anti-establishment. I've already made videos talking about why social media is wrong about seed oils and saturated fat, and I'll link those videos below. But there is another very important subject where anti-scientific social media dipshit influencers have already managed to sway the population away from the scientific position, and that is on the subject of water fluoridation. Water fluoridation, just like seed oils and statins, has become the new focal point of a cringy culture war that is spearheaded by alt-right conspiracy theorists, dude bros, crunchy bombs, impotent NASCAR dads, and even RFK Jr. himself, who has publicly lambasted the fluoridation of water and has attributed it to all sorts of health problems. Internet tough guys, crunchy moms, and culture warriors will commonly lump water fluoridation in along with other things they consider evil, like vegetables, seed oils, statins, and finasteride as being a communist conspiracy theory by Jewish lizard people from Proxima Centauri to feminize men. Well, Chooms, I'm here today to tell you that all these fluoride-hating conspiracy theorists are completely wrong. Water fluoridation is one of the best inventions of the 20th century, and it has dramatically improved the health and well-being of people since its introduction. So first, let's take a look at the history behind the fluoridation of water. The benefits of fluoride were discovered by accident in the early part of the 20th century. The discovery was made not far from where I live, in Colorado Springs. This is how Colorado Springs looks like today, but back around 1900, this is how it looked. Anyways, in 1901, a young dentist fresh out of dental school left the East Coast to open a dental practice in Colorado Springs. The dentist's name was Dr. Frederick McKay. When he got to Colorado Springs, he was surprised to find that many of the residents had brown stains on their teeth. So Dr. McKay and another dental researcher named Dr. G.V. Black spent years trying to figure out the cause of what was known as the Colorado Brown Stain. Today, the Colorado Brown Stain is called Lauren Boebert. But back in the early 20th century, the two dental researchers discovered something strange. They found out that people who had the brown stain on their teeth were mysteriously resistant to tooth decay. Well, it actually took until 1931 before it was discovered that the spring water in Colorado Springs had naturally high levels of fluoride in it. And this is 
what was causing the brown stains on these people's teeth. But the fluoride in the water was also making the enamel of the teeth more resistant to tooth decay. By the late 1930s, water from all over the country had been sampled, and it was found that fluoride was a naturally occurring substance in most well and spring water. However, it was only when the concentration of fluoride exceeded one part per million that it would cause the discoloration of teeth that occurred in Colorado Springs and a few other places where the fluoride levels in water were naturally very high. The next logical step was to test to see if lower levels of fluoride that wouldn't stain the teeth could prevent tooth decay. So, in 1945, the city of Grand Rapids, Michigan voted to add fluoride to its public water supply at a level less than one part per million that would cause tooth staining. Over the next 15 years, researchers monitored the rate of tooth decay amongst 30,000 school children. After 11 years, the rate of tooth decay in these children decreased by 60%. Similar studies of water fluoridation were carried out in other U.S. cities as well as in foreign countries. The results were all the same. Areas with fluoridated water had about a 50% lower incidence of tooth decay than areas without water fluoridation. Based on all these results, water fluoridation was endorsed by the U.S. Public Health Service in 1951 and by the in the 1960s, water fluoridation had become widespread, though not universal in the United States. That's because decisions on water fluoridation are made on a state-by-state -state basis and even a community-by-community -community basis. Overall, though, about 70% of Americans consume fluoridated water. However, almost as soon as water fluoridation was started, many conspiracy theories grew up around it. You can even see this reference from this clip in the movie Dr. Strangelove released in 1964. Have you ever heard of a thing called fluoridation? Fluoridation of water? Uh, yes, I, I have heard of that, Jack, yes. Yes. Well, do you know what it is? No. No, I, I don't know what it is now. Do you realize that fluoridation is the most monstrously conceived and dangerous communist plot we have ever had to face? Anyways, because of anti-fluoride fear-mongering, certain communities decided to stop adding fluoride to the water. One of these communities was Calgary, Canada, which decided to stop adding fluoride in 2011. However, 10 years of data from a study showed that the rate of tooth decay in Calgary was much higher than what was seen in Edmonton, which is a city that continued to fluoridate its water. Because of this, the city of Calgary decided to resume fluoridation of the water in 2021. In Juneau, Alaska, the city council decided to stop water fluoridation in 2003. In 2018, a study was published looking at what happened afterwards. The study showed not only that the mean number of cavities in young children went up, but the cost of dental care went up too after the removal of fluoride from the water. The study added to the overwhelming evidence that water fluoridation is highly effective for the prevention of dental problems, and it even showed that fluoridation saved money in dental care costs. But unlike Calgary and other cities in Canada that looked at the data and decided to reinstitute water fluoridation, Juneau, Alaska didn't because, well, you know, it's Alaska. But I'm sure someone is going to say to me right now, but Kevin, there are plenty of other countries that don't add fluoride to the water, and they're doing just fine, bro, so what do you have to say about that? It is true that most European countries don't add fluoride to their water, but they do add fluoride to other products, which I'll get to in a moment. However, I think it is important to realize that unlike in the United States, most European countries have free dental care for children and have a higher level of health care in general than in the United States. Also, some countries like Germany don't add fluoride to the water, but they do add it to salt, just like how in the United States, iodine is added to salt to prevent thyroid disease. So even if it isn't added to the water supply, it is still added to other commonly consumed products in many European countries. One exception is the United Kingdom, where there is fluoridation of water, but it is only available to 11% of the population. But again, the United Kingdom has a nationalized healthcare system, which includes dental care for low-income citizens. Also, it turns out that the UK is going to step up its water fluoridation very soon. This is because of a recent government survey that showed that children in the areas of England with higher fluoride concentrations of the water were 63% less likely to be admitted to the hospital for tooth extractions. So, there's no doubt that fluoride prevents tooth decay. The scientific evidence is overwhelming. However, some people will still argue that it's no longer necessary to add fluoride to the water because since the 1970s, fluoride has been universally added to toothpaste. Well, I have a couple of points about that. First of all, it is true that fluoride in toothpaste has definitely reduced the incidence of tooth decay. But thanks to fear-mongering about fluoride, there are now a lot of toothpaste being sold that are fluoride-free. You especially see these sold at stores where Crunchy Moms like to shop like Whole Foods. Secondly, even though fluoride in toothpaste is definitely beneficial, there is strong evidence that water fluoridation adds benefits beyond what toothpaste does. So drinking fluoridated water is beneficial even if you are already using fluoridated toothpaste. There is an interesting study 
something about this that was published in the early 2000s from Ireland. This study here. The study compared the incidence of tooth decay in children from Ireland and Northern Ireland. In Ireland, there has been fluoridation of water since the mid-1960s, while in Northern Ireland, there is no water fluoridation. When comparing the incidence of tooth decay over time, there has been a decrease overall, probably due to everyone using fluoridated toothpaste, but even with fluoridated toothpaste, in areas with water fluoridation, the overall rate of tooth decay is almost 50% lower than in areas without water fluoridation. So that's strong evidence that water fluoridation is still beneficial at reducing cavities even though fluoride is commonly added to most toothpaste. So even the most ardent anti-fluoride conspiracy theorists these days will usually still admit that fluoride helps prevent tooth decay. Given all the evidence for the health benefits of fluoride, their only recourse is to claim that fluoride is toxic for your brain. They'll say, but Kevin, fluoride is neurotoxic. It lowers your IQ levels. Like you already showed, it causes the staining of the teeth and it can even cause bone deformities. It's too dangerous to add to the water, bro. It kind of reminds me when people say that they can't take finasteride because of my neurosteroids. So it's true that extremely high doses of fluoride can cause problems. In fact, in some countries like India and China, they have problems with too much fluoride in their water due to natural causes or contamination. So they actually have to defluoridate their water to make it potable. The CDC recommends a fluoride level of 0.7 parts per million, and the goal of water fluoridation is to either increase the amount of natural fluoride in the water to this level, or to remove excess fluoride so that it doesn't exceed that level. The fact is, is that there is no evidence that this level of fluoride causes any problems whatsoever, but we do know for a fact that it helps prevent tooth decay. So there are no downsides to fluoridating water. All it does is reduces tooth decay, which means lower dental health care costs for the entire population. I mean, that sounds like a pretty darn good deal to me. However, the bone broth and butter coffee slurping crunchy moms aren't done bashing on fluoride just yet, Shums. And that's because the biggest recent article to bring the anti-fluoride trolls out of the closet is this article here titled, quote, Fluoride Exposure in Children's IQ Scores, A Systematic Review and Meta-Analysis, unquote. This was a meta-analysis of 74 published studies. As you can see, most of the studies in the article come from China, which is ironic because China, like I said earlier, is a country that has a problem with too much fluoride in their water, either through natural occurrence or pollution. You can also see that there are no studies from the United States which has the strictest standards for water fluoridation in the entire world. The study found an inverse correlation between fluoride levels and IQ scores, meaning the more fluoride exposure, the lower the IQ. However, this study is extremely flawed, Shums. First of all, the majority of the studies in the meta-analysis, 52 out of 74, were deemed by the authors of the paper to have a high degree of bias. In addition to this, the fluoride levels in the water in these studies were remarkably high. The inverse association between IQ and water fluoride levels was only seen in levels of fluoride in the water from 1.5 mg per liter up to 4 mg per liter, but there was no association between fluoride and IQ for levels less than 1.5 mg per liter. Keep in mind that 1.5 mg per liter of fluoride is more than double the amount of water fluoride that is permitted in the United States. So, in a lot of this data, the amount of fluoride in the water is much higher than the recommended amount, but there is no evidence that levels of fluoride in the water which are less than 1 mg per liter cause any IQ problems. In fact, there are other meta-analyses that looked at studies where the fluoride levels were less than 1.5 mg per liter, like this one right here. The study found no association between decreased IQ scores and the fluoridation of water. And there are even more studies showing no link between water fluoridation at levels less than 1.5 mg per liter and IQ scores, and I'll link those studies below. As far as skeletal defects from fluoride, there have been only five cases of skeletal fluorosis which have been reported in the United States, a nation that has over 300 million people who drink fluoridated water. And in these cases, fluoride intake was extremely high, 15 to 20 milligrams of fluoride per day over 20 years. You'd have to drink about 25 liters of water per day to get that kind of fluoride in your system, which is completely impossible. So the bottom line here, Chooms, is that regulated water fluoridation is associated with about a 50% reduction in tooth decay in children, and there are no negative consequences to this level of water fluoridation at all. However, despite all this, we in the United States have a conspiracy theorist as the head of the Department of Health and Human Services, and he wants to ban water fluoridation because he gets his information from Facebook memes instead of scientific research. There's no doubt that if water fluoridation gets banned in the United States, which I think it will be soon, that it will increase the pain and suffering of children as well as increase the cost of medical care and insurance for everybody. 
But coming from a man who's so stupid that he doesn't even believe in measles vaccine, even though unvaccinated kids are literally dying from measles right now, even after measles had been eradicated from the United States in the year 2000, well, it's not too surprising that RFK Jr. doesn't believe in water fluoridation either. There isn't a conspiracy theory that this guy doesn't believe in. We might as well put the ghost of Ray Pete in charge of our health. So usually, when crunchy moms and conspiracy theorists like to rail against science, they'll argue that there is some underlying financial motivation being driven by powerful institutions like Big Pharma. But keep in mind that no one makes a financial profit from putting fluoride in the water. There's no drug company that's manufacturing or has a patent on fluoride. Even dentists don't profit off of it. If anything, dentists have less business because of water fluoridation because it reduces tooth decay. So this is purely a public health measure, and it's often considered to be one of the top public health achievements achievements of the 20th century. Literally everybody benefits from water fluoridation and there are no downsides to it at all. So anybody who thinks we need to stop fluoridating water is a complete idiot and they definitely don't deserve to have any oversight over health policy in the United States or anywhere else in the world for that matter. And like I said in a previous video, if RFK Jr. is stupid enough to believe things like water fluoridation being bad or that vaccines cause autism, then you better fucking believe that he also has a highly negative opinion about finasteride. So if you don't want finasteride to get banned in the United States, you better hope that RFK Jr. never comes across any Facebook beeps about post-finasteride syndrome. Okay, chums, I think that's it for today, but thank you so much for watching. I'll see you all next time. God bless.